Tasia. Hello and thank you that you have survived and you're still here and don't run away to enjoy the sunshine if there is any, I don't know. I've never been there since morning. Um, some of you know and some of you don't that we all fail at building secure mobile apps. It's just that many of you fail more often. <laughs> Tonight, me and my friend will eliminate some of these failures. So who am I? I'm a software engineer. I uh, work in an app development studio in Kyiv, Ukraine. I write iOS applications and also server site for them. And I participate in applied cryptographic research in Kodak Labs a super secret crypto think tank, also from Ukraine. And I'm responsible for the whole mobile thing ever there. And I have a plan tonight. As usual, we will start our journey step by step, discovering infrastructure layout, digging, in, digging into ideas of threats, trust, and keys, discussing key management system, what is a key generation, how to revoke keys, and many other super exciting theoretical things. But of course, we'll apply this knowledge into our mobile apps and talk about secrets. First, let's talk about establishing trust. How do you know that we can trust someone? How do you know that you can trust your friend talking with him or her on the phone? Probably by voice, by certain words. But what about stranger? How do you trust a stranger? probably using some secret keyword. But there is uh, more to that. With super math, there are many ways to build trust to people you don't know and can't easily recognize. Using sharing passwords, using asymmetric keys, using zero knowledge, mm, not today. You probably heard about zero knowledge proof protocol, but not today. We won't talk about it today. Today we will talk about where we establish trust on servers, on mobile, on data in transit, via public channels, and so on. I mean like real things, like cables and stuff. Our infrastructure is full of keys and data and all that in cables, yeah. Cables are important. They out of your control and whatever you reach outside your office, you rely on those creatures. This is a transatlantic cable, by the way, it's not a snake. Just, you know, it's my drawing, so just you to recognize things, this is a cable. With data box inside, this kind of box, this kind of box. Why do we need trust? To protect the data in those cables where evil CI and badass crackers are looking for your secrets. Using super mathematical techniques, we provide guarantees of confidentiality, authenticity, and integrity towards protected data bound to trusted keys or secrets. How does it work? Well, of course, we use magic to protect the data. Uh, yeah. Kinda. Actually, we are binding guarantees to the keys via a certain mathematical process. Input a key, receive a result. Easy. What else do you need to know? It's provable and unhackable if you manage keys correctly. Since keys are what we trust and they control trust in the system, Managing keys, I actually manage and trust. So, let's talk about key management. This is sounds like a, this is sounds like a good presentation, right? Well, you know, secrecy. We reveal things on time, but with a tiny performance penalty. Okay, let's go. On. What is a key? Key is array of bytes. And based on what kind of process is going on, we need different array of bytes with different properties. We use secret keys, 
We use secret keys for symmetric ciphers. We use private public key pair for asymmetric ciphers. We also use passwords. Passwords are shitty keys. Users, also, users always think of really oh, poor, sorry, poor keys. Users always made up some poor keys, but there is a KDF uh, to uh, make this process better. We will talk about KDF later. later. And of course, we have one-time PIN, which is really small and easy to transfer a piece of data with risky properties. Uh, probably this thing you received uh, when you get SMS from your bank, and one-time PIN is additional trust token. We actually won't talk about it a lot, but just to let you know, this is also kind of a key. What kind of keys do we know in our nice iOS applications? Of course, you know all of them. These are app tokens, password, passwords, certificates, really familiar things, right? All of them are keys. Why do we need them? We need them to protect the data to let users access the data, to verify data authenticity and integrity. And of course you know which kind of data. First of all, it's user data or user-generated data we really care about in our mobile apps. Uh, moreover, it can be access to external resources like servers, uh, for example, server tokens or app IDs. It also can be identifiable data of other people which are connected to your app. For example, those who likes your tweets, um, if there is any, of course. What we do protect data from? You are familiar with this picture, probably, I hope. All those well-known threats we can handle and we can't handle, like data tampering, data leakage, active and passive men in the middle, and of course, really common problems like rubber holes, cryptanalysis. But keys, they are a rate of, array of bytes, right? And keys provide those guarantees and we actually, we can use key to access some kind of data. And the thing is the keys are small chunks of data. And from this perspective, the keys are subject to threats too. Well, you know, we are in the same situation actually. Uh, nothing changed except the thing that keys are really small and it's easier to protect 180, 128 bytes, for example, than 50 files. We narrow the attack surface to really small thing, to a key. But there is a lot what can happen with keys. Attacker can steal the key, and that's bad. But what is worse, keys can be, stolen keys can be replayed. They can be used to access something protected. And if you're not lucky enough an attacker is, keys can be replaced. Attacker can throw in his evil key into your system, which is obviously bad. And the idea is to build a system which protects and manages keys that preserves usability. In key management, there is one practical goal. Trust and security are preserved, yet system is still usable. If you don't do that, you will end up with another ultra-secure, super-paranoid end-to-end -end system nobody really willing to use, right? So, let's talk about key management system. This system consists of several processes, which are linked sequentially. From generation to exchange, from exchange to storage and access, with revocation to control compromised and outdated keys, and of course with rotation to ensure key lifestyle, lifetime, lifestyle, <laughs> key lifetime. Sometimes the system should contain some service or some, some maintenance functions. For example, um, allowing other people, admins, to show, to see, to read encrypted data. 
or for example backups something you know some technical things let's talk about them one by one so the goal of key generation is to create mathematically strong trust tokens ones that stand again brute force and smart enumeration uh, the Key generation is based on good random number generation and random number generator and algorithm combined with a secret to produce a key. To ensure that this key won't leak immediately, we need to generate key in the right place in the right time. For example, in the place where user inputs a secret, no, not elsewhere, or in a place when we are going to store the secrets these secrets when we are talking about asymmetric keys, like a key pair. But, uh, the idea is to generate key as close as possible to its user, to their usage or storage. Why? Because if you start application and start with key generation for some function, user will or won't reach opening hundreds of screens and pressing some hidden button, this key becomes really vulnerable. Let's take a look how to generate key pair using elliptic curves cryptography. It's a really easy example, only several lines of code. It's from Themis library I contribute to. You can also, you can generate different kind of keys. There is a lot of libraries for that. You just need to understand what kind of keys you need. And um, probably, probably you don't need to generate so complicated things. When you are, we are talking about user passwords, which is important to understand that yeah, passwords are poor, and they are easy to brute force, they are easy to uh, to guess, and it's better to use KDF. KDF is a simple mathematical function, is a key derivation function that uses something as input, like a password, for example, any string, any bytes as input, and generate cryptographically strong key as output. So attackers will be sad. The thing is, there are a lot of libraries where you can use KDF. I believe there are KDF in Common Crypto too. I'm not sure, but I think it's there. And a lot of libraries hide KDF from you. For example, Themis, you cannot just use it to generate KDF because KDF is hidden, is built inside. But if you deal with user passwords, it's better to use KDF instead of saving password as is, instead of using this password as a key. After we generate keys, the next step is exchange keys between trusted parties, right? Uh, key exchange is really, really important. We need, uh, because we need to do it securely, and there are different approaches to do that. Those of you who remember the story, okay, if there is anyone here that remembers the story about Alice and Bob, the dodo birds, Woohoo! Four! I count four people. Okay. Uh, those of you who don't know the story, these are main characters from one of my slides several years ago. So this is Alice, and she is a daughter bird, and she represents the application. This is Bob. He is a daughter bird, and he represents a sower, and he is standing on a ball on the needle because sowers are fragile and they are communicating with each other. And on that, on that corner, you can see Phoenix Fox Eve, because she's, she eavesdrop the connection. That's why she has a large ears. I guess it was a short introduction of main characters. So, the story about uh, Alice, Bob, and Eve. Uh, when we are talking about key exchange, okay, so in the phase of establishing trust, if some of the, if Alice sends password to Bob, and this password can be easily, uh, can be easily intercepted by Eve, this ruins actually all your scheme, because in this case Eve will use her large ears to read all the data between Alice and Bob. 
This is kind of key exchange, but it's not really secure. In the world of asymmetric encryption, Alice and Bob, they use private and public key pair. Yeah, they're using key pairs, they're now more armored. And uh, they need to trust each other, so they distribute the public keys to each other. And depends on the scheme you're using, uh, they can generate one symmetric key, for example, or they can use the uh, private key and as a party public key to encrypt data. The idea is that Fox, a Fennec Fox, now cannot intercept this connection so easy, and that's why she is sat crying in a, in a corner. Yeah, that's bad. The main idea of key exchange <laughs> is if you want to exchange keys, do it in a secure manner, okay? make this cute foxy cry, ah, whatever. Let's move to the key storing. Key storing is a big deal because we need to store keys securely to minimize risks. And the one big point is, please, never store keys with data encrypted with these keys. It's a bad idea, really. Uh, of course, you know where to store keys on iOS, right? We'll talk about it a little bit later. Once keys are stored, we want to access them to actually use them, right? Uh, and this is another tricky point, because from one point, keys should be easily accessible. From another point, they, could, they should be easily accessible only to those who is allowed to access those keys. So you should put those keys in some secret place, but not really deep. So they are still accessible for you. This is a tricky thing, really, the most tricky thing. And this is a point where a lot of systems uh, break, like SSL handshake, for example. Now, the keys are generated, keys are stored, but do they live forever? Of course, no. The key life cycle is the biography of one single Mr. Key from its birth to oblivion, well, kind of. And the life cycle will specify when keys no longer be used for encryption, will keys no longer be used for decryption, and when key is a key no more. This is really important to define a life, a life cycle of the key. Which is a uh, second thing which is also important that the idea is that we don't want to use one key to encrypt everything. Well, it's really attractive, but unfortunately, it doesn't lead to good from security to good security-wise consequences. We should use different keys, one for uh, for each user, or one for a group of users, or one for a group of records. And this is how we control the risks, actually. But what if keys should be changed? What if your system need to build support for changing those keys? Or, which is more important, what if you want to change your algorithm because somebody has found a vulnerability in this algorithm or attack in this algorithm? The bad thing is that you need to build all your system thinking, what if? And you need to build all this mechanism, how to um, decrypt data, to change key, change algorithm, encrypt the data with this algorithm, probably eliminate and use records, and probably to make sure that unencrypted data in memory is purged correctly. Really, key rotation is a lot of things. The good thing is that probably you, as a mobile developer, don't really care. You just need to understand that it exists. If you're a server-side developer, you should care, yeah. But what if a key life cycle is suddenly interrupted? For example, keys are suspected to be compromised, and we need to revoke them so these keys are not trusted anymore and they should not be used anymore. For example, on every SSL handshake, iOS itself, it checks certificate in a list of revoke certificates. And if this certificate is marked as revoke, SSL handshake will fail. This is a key, uh, key revocation on a system level, 
but probably if you are building a really complicated system, you will need to handle the things yourself with your keys. And we are mostly done with theoretical things. Don't sleep, okay? Uh, there is one more practical consideration. Uh, apart from user features, as I said before, your system probably have some service features, some technical features. Uh, for example, there should be someone who can access the data, like encrypted data. So on many systems, data is actually being encrypted several times using different keys, like one piece of text has been decrypted many times, many, in many pieces, because one key is, is used for user, decrypt, for user encryption, and other keys may use as an admin key. If your system has backup, usually uh, it's better to use separate key for backups, because if user forgot his password, password it will be complicated, complicated uh, to get data from backup if you use the same Key. Yeah, so the main idea is when you're building, when you understand that your system has a lot of functions, you should add additional keys, not just the user keys, but additional keys into this system and of course protect all those keys accordingly. Now, practice time. Let's take a look how trust is established and how do we know that other party is really well the other party. I think it's kind of familiar for you. Yeah, this is a um, URL session uh, check what, what certificate we are using. When we are connected first to the server, we, record, we can record the certificate and check the certificate when we are connected to the server next time. And this thing, on this point, we trust both the certificate and the server. This is how establishing trust looks like on iOS. But it's not the only way to do it. Another popular model is so-called mediated exchange. When you don't connect with another party, but you use some intermediate server to check public identifier of this party, like public key. Uh, for example, it always happens in iMessage. When you write a message to someone new, how iMessage knows the key, it checks with Apple servers. We are not Apple, fortunately or unfortunately, but we can use the servers like Keybase IO that uh, the systems that are used to store public keys of other parties. So before connecting to someone, we know uh, some public ID. We go to Keybase.io, check with this public ID, get the public certificate or public key, and compare those public keys. In this kind of system, we trust Keybase.io and we check other party if it's not compromised, if it's not someone pretending to be the other party. And of course, uh, two methods above, they rely on many assumptions and you still need to trust somebody. The most simple method, it's always the handling key and se or secret uh, like in, by hands, right? Every time when you are building applications that connects to Google API or Facebook API and you go to the developer's Facebook com, for example, you copy paste those app ID and app, app token, app secret. And when you are doing this, when you are doing this copy pasting, basically you are a trust channel. If the idea is the same as you would use pigeons to deliver keys, I wouldn't try pigeons, but this idea of trusted channel. When we establish trust, we usually need to verify trust, and I'm sure you know what is going on here. <coughs> Say me, yes, we know. Yes, we know, because this is SSL pinning. And my really favorite question I ask on each uh, talk, so raise your hands, how many of you have implemented SSL pinning in your production applications? One, two, three, four, five, dozen, uh, two dozens. Yay! Well, actually even more, I would say one third of the audience. It's really easy. It's, re no, no, it's really easy. This is basically 
all code you need if you are using a lemmafier. Uh, you will probably write more code if you are using an SUR session. But there are some tricky things uh, because certificates are tend to expire and you need to handle it. And you also can pin not the whole certificate but some pieces of certificate. If you check the OWASP uh, cheat sheet guide, it has a long explanation what exactly you may want to pin depending on the system you build. But the basic idea is certificate pinning. It's really easy to implement and it saves you from many, many bad things like most like men in the middle. So, key storing. Where do we store keys except code, of course? Keychain! Key I was trying to draw it really understandable. Yeah, of course, keychain. Keychain is awesome, right? Um, and it's great, but you know, great developers avoid storing keys at all. Because if you don't want keys to leak, to be leaked, you just don't store them. Unfortunately, this is like imaginary world with pony and rainbows, and our life is more cruel, so Sometimes we need to store keys, but when we have to, we should put some efforts into protecting those keys from prying eyes. Mostly, we deal with two kinds of keys, user-defined and app-defined. App-defined keys are something that you already have in your app, something you put in your app during the development process, like server tokens or application IDs, etc., etc. It's really... Um, important to store them secure and to access them secure. When we are talking about user-defined keys like passwords, a secret key derived from passwords, it's also important to store it, uh, to encrypt it, and to use KDF. When I talk about key protection, my colleagues think about obfuscation. There are different who thinks about obfuscation as a way of protecting keys. Okay, I'm sure you, you, you thought about obfuscation. There are different ways of obfuscation. We can store keys as hex. We can replace some characters inside strings if our keys are strings, etc., etc. And obfuscation depends on social engineering. So the goal, the main goal is to confuse attacker. For example, you can save server certificate but rename it to mp3. Or you can split keys to different pieces and combine them together. These are all great techniques. You can imagine a lot of, a lot of them. But trained attacker will break this kind of defense in minutes. It's better to spend time on some serious things. For example, store encrypted keys. So when we are developing an app and we have these uh, app defined keys, something we need to store, we encrypt it and store encrypted key. Each time we need it, we decrypt it while uh, decrypt while using, before using actually. This is cool because in this, uh, in this case the only place where you have plain text key is the application memory. And if you do it correctly, you will have this key in the application memory only for a short period of time, which is really great. There are a lot of tools that help you to encrypt data. You know all of them, I'm sure. And I'm sure you know how to pick them up, how to select them. Of course, based on GitHub stars, right? Well, in security, in encryption, it's a little bit more complicated. It's not only star biased selection. Um, it's useful to take a look on who is the author, uh, is it still maintainable, how many issues are there, etc., etc. But also on if this tool has, has been audited, if it has nice track records, if it does uh, respond on some security vulnerabilities found, like remember F networking two years ago, right? etc. I'm sure that you can find a lot of libraries you can use. Of course you can use common crypto, like digging into almost bare metal, but there is some problem with common crypto, you need to understand what you're doing. In other cases, um, there is pl plenty of libraries. It's easy to select library when we are talking about storing encry encryption, about symmetric encryption, 
because there are a lot of IES wrappers. It's more complicated to select a library when we are talking about network encryption, because we need this library on all of the parties, on iOS application, Android app, and the server side, and our choice is uh, should be, you know, we have less options. But we still have many of them. I'm sure you already have your favorite library. Um, let's go next. Several more slides, okay? <laughs> Don't look so sleepy. <laughs> I know it's complicated, but it's cool. Another prominent technique in a school of deception is a fake keys. So make attacker think that he is using the right key and uh, watch locks be alarmed. The idea is that you are putting some so-called marker keys or poison keys in your app or in your database. And during your usual life cycle by normal user, you don't read those keys. You don't send those keys on the server. But when the application is decompiled or when it's used by attacker, there is a chance that these keys will be used. And you can watch logs and see if there is somebody naive enough to use your fake keys. Another really cool technology that works with fake keys is a honeypot. So you don't only use fake keys, but you put those fake keys in some obvious places. For example, you're putting fake key in your playlist and name it some kind of really obvious my secret key, etc. server token, a secret, I know, like something really obvious. But you put your real key really deep. For example, you're storing it, encrypted, and you can also create some functions, fake functions that will attract attacker where you are checking a keys or for example where you are checking if this item was purchased so you're making small oh, sorry you're making small function if item is purchased and it's really easy and it's using these fake keys and you never call it in your code but it exists is this kind of extra code instead their real checks are somewhere deep in code hidden this is an awesome technique, but the idea is that you need to check logs. You need to understand if there is someone who is trying to use those keys, someone who is trying to knock on this door, because if you don't, it's kind of useless. So it doesn't work like put keys somewhere, but also check, update. Um, I know a lot of companies that create products for macOS they, that use these poison keys and honeypot. And uh, this is how they understand how many time people need to crack their app because they see actually the process based on these keys in locks. So previously, um, on my previous talks, which you probably hear or know, I talked a lot about encryption. And on this point, as you can see, encryption was easy and key management is hard. What do we learn today? That there are some weird things called keys that allow us to protect data, but the thing is that those keys are small pieces of data too, and they should be protected too. The idea is to store those keys separately from data, which you are trying to protect with these keys, and to have really a lot of different keys for different needs. Don't rely on one single key for your whole system because it's really easy to break, it's really risky. Of course, a key management system is something long and complicated that has a lot of goals and a lot of functions. Probably in our shiny iOS world we don't need all of them. But the basic understanding, you should have this basic understanding. And uh, when you're making some large and complicated system, you probably should think ahead. I know it sounds weird, think ahead, but you should, you should think ahead which function you're going to have and implement them starting from like day zero, because this is how security works. You should think about it. If there is one takeaway, Mm, it's going to be that for 
there is no religious choices and for every fragment on your system for the whole system and for every piece for every fragment of your of, of your system trust is applied differently and um, you know a lot of instruments not a lot of techniques a lot of libraries but best solutions come from accessing your real architecture your real system, your real app, and fitting tools for this app. I have a lot of links for you to share for your home reading, home watching, etc., etc. I will uh, post the slides in Twitter and on my speaker deck, and you can read them like uh, in a less stressful environment pressing on the links, reading them, and of course you may be interested in reading and watching other my talks because I, I do them, you know, um, they're part of large system, so probably if this one was too complicated or too boring, even, even if I have those nice images, but if this talk was too boring for you, probably you can start from less complicated ones. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. If you have any practical questions, if you want to understand how to do some things, how to build security into your system, I'm here, I'm going to be here for today evening and tomorrow. And of course, if you are too shy, I have a lot of asynchronous ways to contact me. So feel free to ping me to ask questions even if you think they are a stupid one because, you know, I can help. I'm okay to help. I want to help. I want to make our world a little bit more secure. Uh, yeah. Thank you.